Welcome back. In our last video, we talked about the first step in problem solving, getting your hands dirty. And that means experimenting to get a better intuition, not shying away when things get messy, and actually solving the problems, not just waiting for someone else to do it for you. However, many problems do not crack so easily. And there are two issues you may possibly face. What if there isn't anything in the question I can experiment on? And what happens if I don't notice anything interesting even after playing around with the problem for a long time? In this video, we will look at a very powerful problem solving technique, zooming in and out. The first notion of zooming in refers to the level of detail. We can zoom in to various specifics of the question. For instance, why are they telling me that the angle is 45 degrees? Or, hey, I recognize that 1331 is just 11 cubed. Once we recognize this, we can zoom out. We apply these observations to the problem as a whole. To illustrate this, let's start with an example from the 2014 AIME. x1, x2 and x3 are the roots of this equation, square root 2014 x cubed minus 4029x squared plus 2 equals to 0. We are asked to find x2 times x1 plus x3. Pause the video here if you'd like to think about this for a moment. If you tried substituting various values of x, it's pretty unlikely that you managed to find any roots. Instead, let's zoom into the coefficients. Since 2014 was the year number, it probably isn't that special. But do you notice that 4029 is rather closely related to it? Specifically, 4029 is 2 times 2014 plus 1, and that certainly isn't a coincidence. With that in mind, let's look at the equation again. 2014 and 4029 probably have no other significance, so instead of getting bogged down by these strange values, let's zoom out. I'll let a be square root 2014, and therefore 4029 would just be 2a squared plus 1. And then our equation can be rewritten in terms of a. I'll quickly expand the middle term. And let's look at what we have here. Remember that we're trying to solve for x, and since we have a cubic in x, we probably hope to find some sort of a factorization. Now here's a tip regarding factorization. Zoom in to the numerical coefficients first. Here, we see 2 appearing twice. And so that means that it is probably a good idea to group the terms using that observation. If we pull out the common factor from each of these, we get ax minus 1 and a squared x squared minus 1. And we notice that using a difference of squares factorization, a squared x squared minus 1 can further be factored into ax plus 1 and ax minus 1. So therefore, ax minus 1 is a common factor across the entire equation. The next few steps are pretty standard algebra. So let's try moving through it more quickly. First, we can pull out the common factor of ax minus 1 and then equate both of the factors to 0. On the left, by completing the square, we get the first two roots. And on the right, x is just equal to 1 over a, which is the third root. Since we have the roots, let's remind ourselves what the problem asks us to do a is square root 2014 from our substitution, and we have to place the roots in order x1, x2, x3, and then evaluate x2 times x1 plus x3. Looking at these three roots, a minus square root a squared plus 2 is the only one which is negative, making that x1. Among the other two, 1 over a is much less than 1, while a plus square root a squared plus 2 is much greater than 1, and so we can assign x2 and x3 accordingly. Conveniently enough, this means that x1 plus x3 is just equal to 2a. And so multiplying that to 1 over a 
gives us the value 2. And notice how we actually navigated this problem. We zoomed in on two occasions to unusual coincidences and noted them down. After that, we zoomed out to continue tackling the problems based on these observations. I hope the previous example showed us the importance of specifics. And our second notion of zooming in and out comes from splitting into cases. We start by zooming in, which is to analyze one of the cases at a time. And these cases could be things like whether n is odd or even, or maybe the angle A is obtuse or acute. If we manage to successfully tackle one case, we then zoom out and try to apply whatever we have done for that one case to everything else. With that in mind, let's consider this problem. Prove that there are no square numbers greater than 10, which only contain one repeating digit. As always, feel free to pause here if you would like to think about this for a moment. Now, it doesn't seem like there's a one-line explanation for this. So among all these values, let's try zooming into some specific cases. I think we all know that 11, 22, 33, and so on, until 99, are not square numbers. Those are probably a bit too small to be useful. And so let's explore 111 to 999 instead. Looking at these three digit numbers, how would we verify in an expedient manner that these aren't square numbers? Instead of checking them one by one, we could observe that all nine numbers are multiples of 111. And in turn, 111 is 3 times 37. Since we are multiplying something between 1 and 9 to this, 37 will only appear exactly once in the prime factorization. And since every prime factor should appear an even number of times in a square number, this shows that none of them are square numbers. Let's zoom back out to the entire problem then. Can we generalize this to more digits? We can still write everything here as a bunch of ones multiplied by something between 1 and 9. The next step would be to look at this bunch of 1s. But there's an important problem here. We don't have a general factorization of this for an arbitrary number of 1s. And obviously, we cannot just check them one by one because there is no limit to the number of digits in our problem. What does that mean? That probably won't work out. So let's try to split into cases in a different way. Instead of splitting by number of digits, which is horizontal, let's split by what the repeating digit is. In other words, vertically. Looking at these nine cases, recall from our last video that the last digit of square numbers can only be 1, 4, 5, 6, 9, or 0. So that immediately settles four of our nine cases, which is pretty nice. Looking at the other five cases, we notice that for each column, the last two digits are fixed. And that means in turn that their value modulo four is fixed. Now remember that square numbers must be 0 or 1 modulo 4. If we check each of these columns modulo 4, we realize that 4 of the 5 are immediately ruled out because they are congruent to either 2 or 3 modulo 4. That leaves us with one pesky case, the repeated 4s. What can we do with these? Well. Since we have already handled the other eight cases, we can try reducing these to one of those. And it turns out that since four equals to two squared, we can reduce this to the case with repeated ones. We know that those aren't squares. And so if we multiply back by four, the result will still not be squares, which handles the case with all fours. And with that, 
we have covered all nine cases, concluding our proof. Notice how in this example, we had to slice and dice our cases until we found the appropriate dissection. And that's fine. Sometimes, there's no one-size-fits-all approach. We only have a patchwork of smaller ideas. Last but not least, our final notion of zooming in and out is to consider the big picture. We begin by zooming out and trying to get a bird's eye view of the problem. Are there any interesting relationships? And how do things change as we go along? Once we find anything unusual, we'll then zoom into the specific value or entity that we are supposed to find for that particular problem. For our last problem, let's look at a more combinatorial one to illustrate this idea. We are told that a 2020 by 2020 table is filled with ones and negative ones. For each row and column, we tabulate the product of the numbers, which clearly would be also one or negative one. And then, we're given the condition that ri plus ci equals to zero for all i, which means that these products sum to zero for the first row and column, second row and column, and so on. Pause the video for a moment if you'd like to think about this on your own. We'd love to start with a 2020 by 2020 grid immediately, but that's definitely too big. So let's swallow our pride and start with a one by one grid instead. This case is trivial, but slightly interesting because obviously there are two possibilities, but neither of them satisfy the condition because we expect a one and a minus one, which cannot occur. For the two by two case, there are actually many ways to satisfy it, and here are two of them. In each case, we can just try it out, write down the products, and check whether the respective ones sum to zero. Both of these satisfy the condition, but the upper one's optimal, since we want to have as few negative ones as possible. Perhaps the 3x3 three three case will give us more answers. I would suggest that you pause the video for a moment again and think about how you can fill up this 3x3 grid so that all the respective products sum to zero. You might have realized that this is a surprisingly difficult task. Let's say your attempt looked something like this. Where the first two pairs of rows and columns turn out fine, but the third pair gives you a sum of negative 2. If we try to fix it, here's why seeing the big picture is really useful. We could rectify it by changing the third row's negative 1 to 1. And that will indeed fix the issue that we had. However, in doing so, we have also messed up the first column. And that means that we have merely transferred the problem from the third pair to the first pair. If we continue along, we get the sense that a 3x3 grid cannot actually be filled up according to these conditions, and that is indeed true. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to think about why exactly that is so. But in the context of our specific problem, we've made an important observation. By changing one number, in the grid, we have changed two products outside the grid. And this allows us to think a bit more carefully about how we would like to go about filling up the grid. To simulate the 2020 by 2020 case, let's use a 4 by 4 grid since it appears that odd dimensions don't work out. And since we want the fewest number of negative ones possible, let's begin with a grid full of ones where all the products also begin at 1. Now all four sums begin by being equal to 2, which we don't want. But from our recent observation, we know that each time when we switch the sign of one number, we are going to switch the sign of two products, one row and one column. So let's start with this number. 
which switches both the first row and the second column. And in doing so, that will settle the first two sums and make them both equal to zero. Now, we can also change this other number and this will switch the third row as well as the fourth column. As you can see, this means that we only need two negative ones to fix all four sums. And similarly, we can extrapolate this to the original problem where we will only need 20, 20 divided by 2 equals to 10, 10 negative ones to get all the sums to be equal to 0. From this example, we have seen the importance of having a bird's eye view of a problem. When so many of the constraints are all interlinked, we cannot merely consider them one at a time. Instead, we have to observe how a small change affects everything else, and that gives us a better feel for the character of the configuration given to us. And with that, it's time to wrap up. Zooming in and out is applicable to problems in more than one way. Firstly, we try to scale the problem to a Goldilocks size, if you will. Not too general, but not too specific. We aim for just the right level of abstraction to allow us to experiment in a meaningful way. Furthermore, as we do our experiments, we look out for both small details and the big picture, because either of them could serve as the handhold which allows us to proceed on to the next steps. In the next installment of our series, I'll talk about the idea of wishful thinking. It's most useful when something looks oddly familiar, but you can't quite put a finger on why. If you have found this video helpful, please subscribe to my channel. It's encouraging for me and also keeps the YouTube algorithm happy. Thanks for watching and see you again next time.